Hello. In this video, we will start constructing an analytics solution for one dimensional incompressible two phase flow in a porous medium. We derived the conservation equation in the previous video. Now, what we'll do is we'll use that conservation equation to introduce the concept of fractional flow, which will be key when it comes to the analytic solution. So, what we're going to do first is go onto the whiteboard and see everything. So let's let's start with the conservation equation that we did derive in the previous video. So this is the porosity. This is the water saturation, which is as follows. And then there was the Darcy. velocity of the water phase. And that is defined as the volume flowing per unit area, per unit time. So a couple of things we can do straight away. The first one is we know QW because we, can, we know the multi-phase uh, Darcy law, and I'm going to write it now in one dimension. So we can write an equation for QW. Okay. QW is here we have the absolute permeability. We have the relative permeability of water. We have the viscosity of water. And then we got D, D, W by DX minus rho W, G, X. I'm going to have to move myself out of the way. Okay. So let's just go through the terms. This is the absolute permeability here, the capital K. This is the relative permeability, the amount by which the flow is restricted due to the presence of other phases. In this case, we're going to consider oil. Mu is the viscosity of water. This is the pressure gradient in the water in the X direction. Okay, so that should be straightforward. And then we've got the density of water and GX. GX is the component of gravity in the flow direction. So if we've got horizontal flow, there's going to be in one dimension, there's going to be no effect of gravity. We have vertical flow that will just be rho g. And if it's some angle in between, um, it's going to be g sine theta, where that's the angle for horizontal. Okay, so that's, um, that's how we can write it. Uh, just for, for elegance, really, I'm going to define a mobility which has a lambda. And that is written, and this isn't. This is maybe a little bit different from some textbooks that include uh, permeability, but the way I'm going to write it is just the relative permeability divided by the viscosity. Okay, and that just stops me having, whenever I write a relative permeability, it's always divided by viscosity. So it just, it just saves me having to write too much. Um, okay, the next thing we can do here is I could go through the steps that we did um, in the previous video, to derive a conservation equation for oil. But I hope it is obvious that the equation for oil flowing through a porous medium is identical in mathematical form. I just um, exchanged the subscript W for water with O for oil. So if I do that, okay, I get a second equation. And that's gonna be necessary because we do have two variables, X and T, and we've got two things that can vary, which is the saturation. So we have a second equation here, which is exactly like this one. Okay. So that's the oil equation. And the next step towards finding an analytic solution to, to this is in fact to add those two equations up. Let's do that. Just add this one to this one. So zero plus zero is zero. Okay, I'm going to write this as follows, where what I define is what's called the total velocity, Qt is equal to Q oil plus Qw. And then we've got phi, d by dt 
Okay, so the first thing I've done is define this total velocity. Um, the total velocity is the Darcy velocity of oil plus water. And if we assume that we have just two phase flow, so we've got just oil and water flowing, then the total velocity is the total volume of fluid flowing per unit area per unit time. Okay. Um, so that, that's, your, that's your total velocity. Then if we look at this equation, um, if we do have two phase flow, then the pore space is filled with either water or oil. So SO plus SW equals one. And therefore here, one is a constant, it doesn't vary with time. And so this term disappears. So we get QT dQT by dx is zero, for which the solution in general is that we have QT is a function of time only doesn't vary in space, okay? We have just ut as a function of time. So what does that mean? Well, what it means it actually makes total physical sense. Imagine we have a one-dimensional porous medium, if you can see my little pen here, little video clip, okay? And I'm, say, injecting water from the left hand end. And say I inject a cubic centimetre of water each second. If I'm here at the other end, maybe oil is, is coming out. How much oil is coming out? Well, if it's incompressible flow, it's going to be one cubic centimetre a second per second. And what about in the middle, where you might have oil and water both flowing? The sum of the two, the volume per unit area per unit time um, of oil plus water, again, must be a constant, right? So what you find is in one dimension, the total velocity, which is basically the total volume flowing per unit area per unit time, and it's one dimension flow so that the, the area remains fixed so in one dimension you have essentially this qt being a constant okay now it can vary in time after all i can be pumping water i can turn up the pump rate i can have the water flowing faster i could stop the pump altogether so the total velocity can be a function of time but it is not a function of space for incompressible flow um, if you think about this in 3d okay in three dimensions what you find here is it's d by dx, d by dy, d by dz. So it's actually the divergence of the total velocity is zero, right? And for those of you who know anything about fluid dynamics, you're probably familiar with the idea that if you have an incompressible flow, so the flow of water can often be viewed as incompressible outside a porous medium, let alone inside it, then the divergence of the velocity is zero. When we look at porous media flow, it's not the velocity, it's the Darcy velocity, the Darcy flux that is divergence three, three in three dimensions. Okay, so that's actually um, the first result. So let's um, see what that might mean. And now I need to um, make a little bit more space for myself here. So I'm going to erase now um, these bits. So QT, is something that we know, it's a function of time, and it is in fact, it's gonna turn out to be a boundary condition in this problem. Okay, so if we're thinking about uh, flow in an oil field, right, we have wells where we are injecting water. As the engineer, you design the well to be injecting water at a certain rate. So QT is a boundary condition, okay? Something you impose, you design. Okay, so let's, now, Continue, we, we know that QT then is your boundary condition. So let's write QT um, using the multi-phase Darcy law. And at this point, there's gonna be a couple of pages of algebra before we get to, to anything terribly interesting, but I, um, you'll have to bear with me. So it's K lambda W, and I'm gonna actually write out all the terms, right? V P W X plus K lambda w, rho w, g, x. And then here I'm going to add the total velocity is the water velocity plus the oil Darcy velocity. So I'm just going to write um, the other term here. And in fact, I'm getting this wrong straight away, aren't I? Because that should be a minus sign. Okay, so it's gonna be minus k, and then just the same things for the oil, 
Okay. So that's my uh, total velocity. And then what I'm going to define is I'm going to define a total mobility. Which is going to be, I think this is obvious, the water plus the oil mobility. So we're going to have a term here and a term here. But the problem here is we've got a pressure in the water and a pressure in the oil. So we seem to have two pressures. Well, the other thing we know is we've got um, relative permeability as a known function of saturation. We also have the capillary pressure as a known function of saturation, which is the oil pressure minus the water pressure. And so what we can do in this equation is that we can eliminate the oil pressure. Okay, the oil pressure is the water pressure plus the capillary pressure. So if we do that, then we can write this as minus k lambda t dpw by dx. Then there's a capillary pressure term. Okay, so I need to think about that one. That's going to be minus k lambda oil dpc by dx. Okay, because the oil pressure is pc plus the water pressure, and then it's a minus. And then we got the, the, the gravity terms, right? Okay. So we have this equation. Um, it is in fact, an equation to find pressure. Now I'm not going to go through this because it just I just write lots of symbols down on the ball without doing anything terribly instructive or revealing. But if you recall what I'm saying is that QT on the left hand side, that is a boundary condition. You are pumping in an experiment, you have the pump. In the field you are designing your wells to be injecting at a certain rate. Okay, so that's a known function. Okay. Then imagine that in your one dimensional domain, you also know at any one time the saturation distribution. So you know the saturation. Then all of these terms can be evaluated, right? You know the total mobility, you know the relative permeabilities, they are known functions. Okay? So the things you know are the capillary pressure as a function of saturation, the relative permeability as a function of saturation. So the only unknown then in this whole equation is in fact this pressure gradient. Okay. So you can rearrange this equation trivially, just a bit of algebra, to find an equation for the pressure gradient. And then you can integrate that equation to find the pressure. And again, you need a boundary condition. And again, the boundary condition is set by you as the engineer designing the field. You will be injecting, um, for instance, at a certain rate and your production well will be maintained at a certain pressure. If you're doing an experiment, you can measure uh, the pressures. Okay, so there will be a boundary condition, which would be a pressure um, either at the inlet or the outlet, um, and you can integrate that to find the pressure. So if I know the saturation everywhere, I can find the pressure from this equation. The only problem is um, I need to know the saturation. So I need to solve an equation for saturation as well. Okay, so I need to know the water saturation, for instance, and the water pressure. Okay, and from that, I can find the oil pressure from the capillary pressure, and I can find the oil saturation from one minus the water saturation. So that's what we're doing mathematically. Now, the reason why I'm waving my hands and saying this, rather than writing lots of things, is that in the one dimensional analytic solution, we don't actually explicitly need to know the pressure. We can actually solve the saturation directly without having to sort of refer back to the pressure field. So that's why I'm going to sort of one and say move on. But this here is um, okay, quite useful. Um, and I, what I'm going to do then is actually I'm going to use this equation to eliminate this term dpw by dx in this equation right, using this. Okay. So what I want to do is again I need to make um, some space here. I'm going to get rid of this this. Okay. I'm sort of going to go backwards up this because I've got the I've got the equation I, I want here at the bottom. 
and I'm actually not going to use the all equation again, so I can get rid of that one. Let me explain what I'm going to do. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find dPw by dx. I'm going to put that in here to find Qw, and then I've got an equation essentially for saturation. And I will show that by doing that, I eliminate the pressure. I just have an equation for saturation with terms that are function of saturation. I don't need explicitly a pressure value. Okay, so let's, let's um, explain how I'm going to do that, right? It's just a piece of algebra. So I'm going to write minus, let's, you don't need to do it in red. So we've got minus K D W by dx. Okay, and then what we have in here is actually a lambda w term. So you also want to multiply this by lambda w, replace it. So that's going to be lambda w over lambda t times whatever this is. Okay, and remember there's a minus sign here, minus. Okay. So it's lambda w terms lambda t. Now, what other terms have we got? We've got qt here. Then we're going to put this over the other side plus k lambda zero naught point. And then these go over the other side, so these seem to be um, negative minus. And I'm sorry, it should be a minus sign because it goes over this side of the equation. Okay. So now what I have is I have an equation here. This object is essentially this object, and I'm going to put it in the equation for QW. So because I have restricted space, I'm afraid I'm going to have to sort of erase my previous line of working as we move along. So now what I can write is QW is equal to this term. Okay, so I'm actually now going to write it out. Lambda W over lambda T. Plus K. Minus K and a W squared. And we seem to have left out a row, row north here. Okay, so those are the terms we had before. I left out a gravity term, but hopefully you can see um, that, 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 was, that was obvious. Okay, so I've wrote, written everything out. Now I've got a plus lambda wk. I've got a plus here, this term. So it's lambda w, okay, which is this times k. And then I've got a rho w, g. Okay, so that's my equation. And, and, and at this stage, it's not looking terribly illuminating because we've got all these sort of confusing um, gravity terms that seem to be sort of all over the place. Okay, so let's just go through how we're going to simplify those gravity terms. Okay, so maybe at this point, I'm going to put in another color and I'll show you what I'm going to do. Everything here is divided by lambda t. So let's make that. Um, by lambda t. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this bit by lambda t, obviously, but I'm going to write it as lambda w plus lambda oil. Okay. So now let's look at the terms because here we have a minus, I mean, there's always a k and a lambda t. So sort of, you know, don't overthink those ones. It's a minus lambda w rho wgx. Here we're going to have a plus over lambda t, lambda w squared rho wgx. So actually, if we um, put this in red, this term is going to cancel with that term. Okay? 
So now what we're left with is a plus lambda w lambda oil rho w g x, and then a minus lambda w oil uh, rho uh, lambda o or o o g x. Okay, so um, this has got the water density, and this has got the oil density. So if we um, just write that out a little bit more neatly. You get the following, and the following is actually quite important. So, um, so we can write Q W is equal to right. Then I'm going to actually put the gravity terms next, and I'm actually going to give them a different colour because you know this is in you know, these, these are important. It's a K lambda W lambda oil over lambda T, okay? And then we have we have a density difference, turns out. And then I'm gonna have a third color, which is this. Okay, and now again, to give myself a little bit of room, I'm going to erase that previous line. Okay. And now I'm going to annotate these three terms. There's a reason why they're in different colors and then explain what they mean. I'm sorry, this wasn't red, this was in green. And then in black. Okay, so what we find is that QW, which is the volume of water flowing per unit area, per unit time, basically how the water's moving and you place it in the equation um, above. It has th three terms, and these are not just sort of a bit of algebra and some terms sort of randomly slopping them around on the paper. They have a physical meaning and they can only be uh, written in the way they are. So let's go through them one by one. The dominant term in general is this first one, it's advection. That's going with the flow. So we got water, it's moving. How does it move? compared to the total velocity, which is, you know, what you're injecting. Well, it's a ratio of mobilities, isn't it? If the water can move easily compared to oil, you'd expect it to take most of the flow. So what we have here is a ratio of mobilities. The total mobility is the total mobility of both the water and the oil combined. Um, and the water mobility is just, is just the mobility of the water. So for instance, if you're injecting just water, the oil is at its residual saturation, it is not moving, there is no mobility of oil, and that ratio is one, it's just water flow. If we have the other way around, that we're at uh, the conate water saturation, the mobility of water is zero, and it's all oil flow, and if we're somewhere in between, how much flow we have of the water is not a sort of linear relationship or something to do with saturation, it's to do with the relative permeability or the mobility, or strictly speaking, it's relative permeability, but divided by viscosity. This tells you how readily a phase flows. So the water flow is going to be the total flow times its mobility divided by the mobility of the two phases. That come. But that's not the only physical effect. The other physical effect is if you, um, if you don't have horizontal flow, and if there is a component of gravity in the flow direction, say you're flowing downhill, okay, the water would tend to flow more readily. There'll be a larger flow of water because it is denser, right? The dense fluid flows downhill. Oil, which is less dense than water, actually has a tendency to move up relative to the water because it's buoyant in the presence of water. Okay. So this is the gravity term. 
and it's proportional to a density difference. And this is the interesting thing. Often, actually, some people get a little worried when they see this form of Darcy's law because they say well, there's a positive term for water and there's a positive term for gravity for oil, but oil would tend to want to move up in the presence of water and I'm getting confused and there must be a sign wrong. No, the Darcy law is correct as written. When you carefully and calmly go through all the equations, you find that the water velocity is indeed, in the end, proportional to, or has a term that's proportional to a density difference. And in fact, that's the only way it can be. So is a density difference. The interesting thing here with the mobility terms, what this represents is actually gravity segregation, oil moving up relative to water. And for that, you have to have the oil being able to move. After all, if the oil can't move, it can't move up. OK, and the water has to be able to move. So in fact, this term is proportional to the product of the two mobilities. Then we have a third term. Now, the third term is interesting. This is capillary pressure. And what does that mean? Well, imagine we got, I had a, a piece of rock that was water wet. Water would spontaneously soak up into the rock, right? You'd have an imbibition process. So even with no gravity and no pumping, actually, no net flow, no pushing the water in, water would actually want to imbibe into the rock. So there is a, an additional term, which is a capillary pressure term, and it's related to a, a pressure gradient. You know flow is driven by a pressure gradient, so it's the gradient of capillary pressure that drives the flow. And again, it's got these two mobilities because if we're, if we're looking at an imbibition or capillary driven process, the water will want to move in, right? And so you've got to have a mobility of water, but where does the oil go? The oil is actually escaping um, out in an opposite direction if it's entirely capillary controlled. And so those two mobilities come into play. The other thing to think about is the sign of this um, term. Actually, the sign of this term, if we look at it carefully, if we imagine, say, looking at saturation against distance, you might imagine that you inject water and it's a high saturation, and somewhere later over here, the water is at a low saturation. So dSW by dx, the saturation gradient, is negative. But then if we look at the capillary pressure, right, the capillary pressure will also have a negative slope. So the capillary pressure decreases with saturation. This is a, a water flood capillary pressure curve and it can indeed go negative. So DPC by the SW is always negative. And we could put an equality sign here. So this term, DPC by dx, just by the chain rule, is DPC by the SDS dx, okay? So this term, okay, is in fact a positive number. So there are three things that contribute to the flow, okay? So they're always, the three things are contributing. Okay, how I'm going to um, finish now is with what's called the concept of a fractional flow. So what's the fractional flow? And what it is, is we define QW can be written as FW dt. Okay, that's just a definition, all right? So what I can do here, all right, rather than just writing everything out again, right, I can change this to the fractional flow, and I've divided by QT, so this one goes, right, change my color now, and I've got, whoop, I've got here. Okay, and then I can change my color here, so my fractional flow is just QW over QT. That's, that's just what the fractional flow is. And what the fractional flow represents physically, it says what fraction of the total flow, right? Normally what I'm injecting, okay, is taken by the water. And of course, this will be a function of both space and time. So we'll be looking at somewhere in the middle where the saturation is varying both spatially and in time. And so this fractional flow will change. But the fractional flow as written, the interesting thing, when I look at this fractional flow here as written, it's only a function of saturation. 
So the saturation varies with space and time. We also have a pressure field that varies in space and time, but the fractional flow is just a function of saturation, okay? So this is, this is a function of saturation. These are just complex functions of saturation. PC is known as a function of saturation. Okay? So these are saturation dependent terms. And the reason why that's important is now if I put this in the partial differential equation, and so this is how I'm going to conclude. We look at this equation and then now put FWQT in here. What we have is we have D by DX of FWQT. But just a moment, D by DX of QT is zero. So that comes out of the derivative. So in fact, we get a, a simpler equation. So we get a, a, a simpler equation like this, where the QT comes out because dQT by dx is zero. So this is, this is the equation now that we're going to solve. Okay. So this is the equation we end up with. I agree it's taken a little bit of work to get there, right, and a little bit of algebra, but it all makes physical sense. This is the equation, the conservation equation that we're going to solve. And there are three terms that have a physical meaning and significance. And so what we're going to do over the next few videos is actually explore solutions to this equation under, under different limits. So I will conclude there. Okay. I will go through the, the solutions in a later video. So thank you very much. <laughs>